Well, this weekend, the Pentagon, among others, remain on high alert for a possible North Korean nuclear test. There are signs it could be imminent. And the news comes as joint U.S.-South Korean war games continue on the Korean Peninsula. And experts warn we may be closer than ever to a point where a war of words turns into a real war. Let's bring in Dean Cheng, senior fellow with the Heritage Foundation's Davis Institute. So we, we've seen this before. We've seen nuclear tests before. We've seen missile tests before. We've seen all the rhetoric from Poignyang. The question is, when, at what point are they going to do something that the United States and South Korea is forced to respond to with something other than words? This is a country that uh, basically sank a South Korean frigate without warning, shelled South Korean territory, at one point blew up the entire South Korean cabinet. Um, I think it's very difficult to predict at what point they will do something that goes totally beyond the bounds of acceptable behavior. What is, what is their game here? If the, if the game is simply regime survival, why keep poking the proverbial bear that is the United States military? Well, in the first place, past pokes haven't led to any reaction. Do they um, want a reaction at some point? Do they need it? Does he need that kind of, he, does he need that to improve his standing with his own people? That certainly doesn't hurt, but I think part of it also is keeping the Americans at arm's length. I mean, this is your classic madman theory. Um, if I'm willing to do this just on a random Tuesday morning, imagine how I might react if you actually came back at me. So stay far away from me or else. Well, and we all know that any time Kim Jong-un is anywhere, there's not a lot of people far for him. We have this picture that we found, and this struck us as, shall we say, unusual. Was this a choreographed, a impromptu piggyback ride or is there something else going on here from a guy who has purged so many people even relatives around him this is a man who has ordered the execution of close partners and even family members with anti-aircraft cannons. So you don't you don't just jump on him for a piggyback ride be really risky <laughs> so what what's the message this picture is trying to send if everything's choreographed why put something like that out I think the message there is, look, we had this great accomplishment and even senior military and political leaders around Kim Jong-un are just delighted. Look at what we've achieved. Look, look, at, look at how happy we are. I'm so happy I'll give you a piggyback ride. Yep. That's one way to show, uh, I guess, appreciation to your military. Mm -hmm. uh, so where, where does this go for here? We have the U.S.-South Korean war game sort of continuing for the next couple of months. We've had this rhetoric from the U.S. Secretary of State who at least sort of made an overture that there could be U.S. military action. Do we get to that point or does this sort of, does everybody walk away and decide to fight another day? Well, actually, the administration has already demonstrated a greater resolve. It has cut off North Korea's banks from the global financial system. This is hitting North Korea and particularly the Kim family where it hurts. And that was just about the same time that Secretary of State Tillerson said, everything's on the table. So we're actually seeing more sanctions and more moves being does that, put does in that, place. Does that increase the chance that they, for lack of a better term, go nuclear? Or does that mean that the Kim family goes, you know, uh, maybe we're not going to take this guy on? When you hurt the guy in his pocketbook, I think that you are really forcing them to consider if things keep going down this path, you're really not going to be left with anything at all. And we, we keep hearing, from at least from the administration and our sources there, that they're willing to continue to twist the thumbscrews. Uh, Dean, uh, excellent analysis. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank great, you for having Great you. having you. about that? Like, do it. Never, never time. Oh, T, baby. I haven't done this in a while. too long. Yesterday, and then we had, like, breaking news <laughs> too long. for a couple days yeah. there. And I am so glad And when we do it without you, it doesn't... Get us oh, into the right oh. enthusiasm into OT. So sweet. I, yes. I'm, I'm excited. It doesn't. <laughs> I can't remember the last time. First of all, it's been a minute since you were here, mm -hmm. and I don't think you guys have been on together. We haven't. No. Yeah. I mean, this was paprika. <laughs> it was oh. a special. It was you a know what? Nice spice. I knew it would be. <laughs> yeah, it was a special. So I you only know, know Marie I, from TV. That's you it. You know what I did? That I thought it was very respectfully done, by the way. Well, I yeah, collected yeah. questions mm -hmm. on Twitter. Okay. Because people say, oh, we love the live chat, but I'm traveling today. Can you do Twitter? <laughs> All right. So uh, George Pizanowski says, one of two. I'm only going to read the first one. <laughs> All this talk about health care. Why can't we just have some health care the same as Congress? Anybody? Well, 
I wanted That's to continue our feisty conversation. Well, yeah, feisty. Feisty. <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 what health care does Congress get again? Uh, it's it's like a golden Cadillac model, yeah. I believe. It's, I it's love pretty the bill. nice. <laughs> Marie was very silent, which tells me it's pretty it's pretty good, right? It's, it's really nice. Yes, which is it's why Congress really nice. never vote for a bill that I like that I really like, which would put every member of Congress on the same health care that Feths get. We'll see. How yeah. Long, yes, how, how long I agree. That with yes. That. So that's what uh, we should do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question, George. One more real quick one, and then we'll go back to spicy. This may get us spicy. there, though. This is Pamela. <laughs> Sharon, she says, why do I never get a response? Now you are. Another penalty? Remove the 30% penalty paid to insurance companies. Put a waiting period instead. They're talking about this sort of backdoor mandate is what yeah. she's talking about. And yeah. instead of paying the government via the IRS. Yeah, I don't know why they're doing you're gonna, that. You're going to pay this penalty, this 30% to get onto insurance if yours lapses or you, you know, for whatever reason. Part of me thinks it. that'll be gone by the time the so talk is So Kurt, yeah. Kurt Halla, Harlocker um, wrote this, Pete. Pete is the voice of common sense, totally on board <laughs> with him about the health care plan. Make it as conservative as possible now. Get it right the first time. Yeah, but the problem, so I agree with that as an opening position, but we all know that it, whatever, when the sausage gets made, it's going to be a bill that almost nobody likes. Listen, right? I was surprised with Paul when it first came out. I was surprised that it was sort of not, you know, expansion of Medicaid, keeping the Cadillac tax, things like that. I was very surprised it was kept in. I just want the Freedom Caucus and the moderates and everyone in between to work collectively together and to talk to Paul Ryan, to speak with Donald Trump. I keep calling him Donald Trump. People get mad. President Trump. It's, you know, I've been watching him on TV my entire life. It's an old, old habits break but I just want us all to collectively to come together and work together because it gives too much ammo to the left when we don't. Pete can I ask you a question on this if I know no Republicans we'll talk about foreign policy and then again. we'll go to foreign policy then we'll go to foreign policy I know Republicans don't believe or some Republicans don't believe the numbers but if some of these numbers are right and a bunch of people lose their insurance or or if the cost goes up significantly particularly for the elderly are you okay with that? It's not that I'm a, I, I don't think that's what will happen. And that's why, but if that's, it does, but if it does, play just no. I mean, you know. Listen, what, what I think the left here. wants to do is get to single payer health care. That we we know that's where they want to go. A lot of people feel betrayed by Obamacare in the first place. They wanted to go further, and if that's your goal, then you think everybody's covered and everybody gets great care. Having seen the VA and what that actually right. means when yep. you get single payer, it's not good. So just because you have additional million number of people on a care or a bad plan doesn't mean they're getting good care. Right. I think you have to re incentivize the market. So. I, I don't want anyone to lose their health care, but, but I, I want to let up. people choose to not have it if they want to. If costs go up, is that an acceptable outcome? They can't go up any faster than they went on that's, under that's Obamacare. Not, that's not true. I don't want How about if up? costs go up at first, but longer term they come down? Which is what they say is going to happen. saying would happen. Because of the really steep cuts to Medicaid, which a lot of people rely on. Okay. Um. All right. Let's talk foreign policy. Let's go <laughs> no, back can, to the mattresses, I, people. Okay. All right. So during the TV the version of us, and I'm just reading the live chat because people are like, talk to me about ISIS. Um, you know, you guys were kind of going at it a little bit. One thing we didn't bring up, so I can't wait for this discussion, North Korea. I haven't talked about that oh, God. at all. Oh, boy. Uh, Marie, really, mm -hmm. the past administration sort of looked at that with a side eye. And it has festered. Under Barack Obama's watch, it festered. So this is where we are now. Mm -hmm. And when I hear criticism that President Trump is putting too much emphasis on China and North Korea, I scratch my head. These guys are crazy. I mean, they, they are. They, no. They, they are crazy. I, they're, they true. are. Oh, they're God. willing to kill their neighbors with a nuclear weapon. So yeah, what I would say yeah, is, what, throw their 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 uh, what he's fed his brother to be eaten alive by wild dogs. Yes. I mean, I mean so but what I would say is, state. every president comes in for the last several facing the North Korea challenge, and every president very quickly realizes that there aren't a lot of good options. And what we in the Obama administration did was put, along with the UN the toughest international sanctions on North Korea that have ever been in place. That clearly hasn't changed their behavior. So then you get to a point, and you heard Rex Tillerson doing a little bit of this during his recent trip to Asia, that all options are on the table. Military options, and Pete would know this better than anyone, there's not good military options either. So you're facing a situation where we deployed extra resources to South Korea and Japan. We're working with the Chinese to try and get them to pressure the North Koreans more. But there's not like a perfect option that we just weren't willing to take and that the Trump administration can't No, there now. isn't a perfect option. But what the what the bad thing that that was done that, that I think the Obama administration did time and time again, which is so foolish, which is to take the military option off the table to begin with, which means mm. you're never negotiating mm -hmm. from a true position of strength. And you also, the, the administration was obsessed with 
things like global zero on nuclear weapons, which is this ridiculous <laughs> it like argument. Spot treatment. No, it doesn't. When did we take, when did we take military options about, off the table with North Korea? I don't remember doing that. You took it off the table that. with Iran, which, which, no, which the, led to a the very bad, said silly deal. No, actually, the president specifically he was not, not taking military options off the There's not a soul the on the planet that ever believed he would use it. The not a soul. The Iranian threat has to be credible for it to be effective. I don't buy that I sat in those meetings negotiating that nuclear deal. The Iranians believed her. They wouldn't have been there. I don't buy that for a hot second, even if I was in the meeting or not. The perception is reality that that he was never going to act militarily, and therefore they could get a better deal. I want to take it back. Cynthia that. Ann five 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 says no, 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 no. We got to take it back to ISIS. Uh, she thinks you. <laughs> We're making she 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 made She's a good. great point. If you have sworn allegiance to ISIS, your citizenship is not with the country you reside in or were born in, such as the case of London terrorists. Hashtag revoked. But Harris, you made a good point. In a democratic society, you can't just strip someone's citizenship without due process. I mean, it is very hard to take someone's citizenship away. And so you can't just So start. maybe we should rethink that. Wait, why can I, can why I do we have to be question? wedded to the existing model? I assume if, from, if that's we're, a pretty bold statement. Fine. I'm, uh, we we should live in bold socks? times. Uh, no, I, I, I know. I just. <laughs> we face a generational and existential type threat that is based on an ideology that's well grounded, that is, is on the offensive and extremely violent. We haven't dealt like the Nazism was a conjured up you know, uh, thing that, that was, was built by Hitler. Islamism is based on a theology that is far more coherent, well funded, and well, spreading. I don't than think we would, that either would be more or less dangerous. Dangerous. But I mean, event, right. the, the, the silent, the, the loud and silent invasion of Islamism is the cause of our time and whether or not we, we, we actually fight it. Where do you, do you really Wait, wanna, Can I ask yeah, a question? Ahead, sorry. So I assume from the way you were talking on the show that on some level you like the Freedom Caucus and you, ideologically you're a little bit aligned with them. Is that, is that fair on enough? On some things, but not on a lot of the national Okay, because I was going to say, mm -hmm. yeah. when it yeah. comes to civil liberties and national security, I mean, they're, to say that they're the polar opposite of me is putting it very lightly. Yeah. And they would say, you're infringing on their civil liberties. I'm like you. I'm like, you want to kill me? You want to stop my way of life. Screw you. Take your citizenship away. You can go to Gitmo. You can go to someplace else. I don't really care. And do you want to know why my life, way of life, is better than yours? Because I can go outside in a tank top without getting stoned. That's why America is better than that way of life. Boom. Hands down. No, and I don't. I, agree. I have zero patience for it. I have. I am unmovable on this. As I tell you, it's my Achilles heel. Fastest way to get me riled up. I went to a dinner party one time where I had to leave <laughs> on this very issue. Not even kidding. So I, but for me, like with people like the Freedom Caucus with things like that, that is part of the reason why I have such problems with them right now is because I find in instances, especially like national security, that you're looking at the macro or the micro, excuse me, and not looking at that's yeah, right. Macros have the micro. Right. And I just don't understand going forward. That is why just going back to the politics of them at the same time, why I find them so dismissive of the rest of the party in so many ways. I think people like us, especially when it comes to national mm -hmm. security, are living in reality a lot more good than they are. Than we can. Well, yes, but also, uh, yes. citizenship isn't a shield. So, for example, and going back to the Obama administration, ordering a strike on a U.S. citizen, Anwar al awlaki killing a U.S. citizen in a drone strike, um, his citizenship couldn't shield him from that kinetic action that we decided to take. And you can criticize other things, but getting him off the battlefield was actually a good thing for American security. So I'm not saying that there's no limits to this, but when you start talking about taking it, that's just, you're going down Obviously a slippery slope. Obviously there's going to be a process. I mean, I'm not slope. saying you get to say your Before citizenship is gone. Before we go, we've got a minute, a minute left. Um, there's a lot of questions, Marie. A lot of people want to know more about like where you came from before you worked at the State Department, okay. like what your past was. So oh, that's those are deep. People questions. love to listen, <laughs> uh, love to learn something. So about I started in Washington as a career CIA officer, nonpartisan in the Bush administration. I was an analyst. I focused on Saudi Arabia and the Middle East. That's what I'd studied. And I did that for six years. I was our spokesperson towards the end of that for Bush and Obama administrations. Then I went to the campaign. Oh, a lot of people may not know that. Exa yeah. I was a spokesperson for Mike Hayden when, and he's one of my favorite go. bosses. So on national security, I am actually not one of the things I was getting at in, in on it, the it, show. It, but, but they were just asking kindly. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. A no, challenge. no, no, I know. But on the show, you know, I got a lot of criticism from liberals in my party working for the CIA, working when we were taking a lot of action against criticism terrorists. For working for the CIA? Yes. That's oh, the left. they can. They can. Oh, come on. They can. But, I mean, but, I can't say that on this. You know, that, that is. I became like a spokesperson okay, later in life. Cool. Excellent. I'm more of a national security nerd. Very cool. cool. Well, it's great to have you on, Pete. Thank you. It's great to be here Good always. To see Thank you. Guys. We'll yes, see Pete. Back here tomorrow for more out number. Thank you. Oh, dear baby. Bye. Well, with so much focus placed on the alleged Russian infiltration of our presidential election, another possible threat to our democracy may have slipped through the cracks, and that is China. A new Department of Defense study has raised some alarm bells about what Beijing may be up to. That report discovered the Chinese government is directing investment companies with close ties to invest heavily in American technology startups, mainly firms dealing with sensitive military technology. 
Well, some fear China may be more after the profits, but some American secrets as well. Our next guest is an old China hand, is the author of this new book that chronicles his father's service in World War II, from the home front to the battlefront, an Ohio teenager in World War II. I'm pleased to have Frank Lavin with us. He's the former U.S. ambassador to Singapore, under Secretary of Commerce in the George W. Bush administration. Ambassador, good to see you. Thanks, Eric. Good now, to be here. Now, you, uh, you're head of a company called Export Now. Right. You work in China, so you know how they think. Sure. What are they up little, to? Little. Look, I'm not surprised at all uh, that we're seeing this story, meaning uh, much of uh, U.S. technology innovation has some kind of uh, security or defense uh, application, and uh, we should expect, we should fully expect that foreign countries would seek to acquire that legally or illegally. So the, the fact that uh, we're seeing indications of Chinese companies, some of them that are government-linked, investing in these startups and so forth, uh, shouldn't be a surprise. I think really the burden's on us in the United States, our tech companies, our investment groups, the, the FBI, to make sure we've got the proper enforcement mechanism, the proper protections in place. Do we have that now, and do you think they can pluck out our secrets? Uh, I think we historically have done a pretty good job with it, but I don't think it's fully up to speed to where we need to be in this tech age. Meaning, historically, we have this CFIUS mes uh, mechanism. CIF CFIUS is a Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States that reviews, mm -hmm. approves the security implications of acquisitions. So if a German steel mill wanted to acquire a U.S. steel mill, it had to go through a formal review process to see if there were security implications. That worked very well. This is different. This is just investments in tech companies where people are trying to acquire specialized technology that might have defense applications. I don't think we have a, a full system in place to guard against that. That's that, that if you some you know, have concern about the Russian-Uranium ore right. deal you right. know, uh, that, that the Russians grabbed. So I mean, are you confident that we can address this? Uh, at some point, yeah, I think so. To protect us, I think so. What we've got to do is uh, broaden the scope of CFIA so it uh, allows for investment, not just acquisition. We've also got to make sure the FBI is working closely with the tech community. To to people need to be on guard that if you're getting inquiries and investments from overseas, you need to have a reporting mechanism. You need to get help from people in the uh, intelligence service in the United States to make sure you're not making any mistakes. I mean, well, we got one eye over there looking for what they're doing. What about North Korea? Yeah. Uh, I mean, they have protected North Korea at the Security Council all these years. They're responsible for 90 percent of the trade. Why won't they? What, what would happen if they I, turn off the spigot, the oil, and just turn off the lights? Well, but there's two or three uh, scenarios there, one of which is positive that North Korea sort of moves toward a uh, more rule-abiding regime. That's the positive scenario. The less positive scenario is that there's economic collapse and then China gets the refugees, so they don't want that. Or the worst case scenario is some kind of conflict breaks out and nobody wants that. So there's risk involved in a complete shutdown. I don't think we would seek that from China. What we in the United States do want from China is more of an edge to what they're doing in North Korea, a harder push, a tougher sanctions, tougher economic might to help North Korea move the right way. The Secretary of State Tillerson was just uh, uh, there. Do you think that the Chinese will finally get that message and they'll take stronger action? Well, interestingly, I do think they're getting the message, not so much necessarily because we're directly requesting it, but because they see South Korea putting the THAAD, the anti-missile system, in place. They're concerned about South Korea moving more toward us. They're concerned about what we might do. So they know unless they play some kind of constructive role in this process, there's a, there's a chance that South Korea or even Japan escalate themselves. And finally, you know, we've got all these threats we talked about. Your, your book is about your dad, he, a, a, a teenager from Ohio, he was in the Battle of the Bulge. My dad shot down into B-24. What lessons are there from our fathers to the, to the new generation when you consider the threats that we face as Americans today? Well, uh, you know, that was an era of enormous national sacrifice. Your dad, my dad, several million Americans under arms. Uh, I think what, what I take away from that book is, look, we we concerned in history about what Churchill did and what Truman did, what Eisenhower did. Let's not forget that it's a million or two million teenagers or 20-year-olds that are actually fighting that war, and the country called on them to make that sacrifice. They rose to the occasion. The Battle of the Bulge is the greatest battle, the largest battle the U.S. Army has ever fought. 600,000 direct combatants, 400,000 support combatants. I mean, a massive, a million people in one battle, 20,000 American casualties, 20,000 killed beyond the casualties and 40,000 prisoners. So extraordinary price to pay to hold that line and make sure Hitler didn't smash through the Ardennes. It's a tough story, but it shows you, I think, when the chips are down, your dad, my dad, rose to the moment. We can take inspiration and have aspirations from what they have done in the service in the past. Frank, congratulations on the book. Thanks, sir. Thank you for joining us. We'll get you back to talk about uh, China because that issue and North Korea are not going away. Not going away. Of course. Thank you. Yesterday, an act of terrorism tried to silence our democracy. But today we meet as normal, 
as generations have done before us and as future generations will continue to do, to deliver a simple message. We are not afraid, and our resolve will never waver in the face of terrorism. British Prime Minister Theresa May addressing Parliament Thursday, one day after a terror attack in central London that left four victims dead, including one American and dozens of others injured. The attacker, identified as 52-year-old British-born citizen Khalid Massoud, drove a car into pedestrians on Westminster Bridge and then attempted to enter Parliament, stabbing a police officer before being shot and killed. Wednesday's attack came on the one-year anniversary of the Islamic State assault on the airport and subway station in Brussels and also follows last year's truck rampages in Nice and Berlin. Wall Street Journal columnist and editorial page writer Sorab Amari joins us now from London. Welcome, Sorab. Hi, Paul. Okay, so uh, Islamic State has claimed credit for this a day after the attack. Is, do British authorities agree that this looks like it was Islamic State uh, at least inspired? I think that's still something that they're investigating. They've made a number of arrests in Birmingham and elsewhere where Khalid Massoud had links, Paul. Um, the Islamic State itself, through its media channels, has claimed responsibility and said Khalid Massoud was a quote-unquote soldier of the caliphate. Uh, but that still remains to be seen because the, the organization has a tendency to do that, where right. people who are inspired by its message, who are lone wolf uh, characters, after the fact, when they go out, then the organization takes credit for them. And it really doesn't matter in a, war, in a, in a way because uh, they, had no, they may never have had, had any uh, direct contact with the organization. It may not have been plugged into official jihadist networks, but nevertheless drew inspiration from it. And then uh, Islamic State can point to the fact after, afterwards and, and uh, if, feed this to its supporters as a success. All right. One thing we haven't heard so far is a lot of evidence from his computer or uh, literature he was reading or anything like that, which typically yeah. in the United States with these kinds of attacks ha does come out pretty quickly. We haven't seen that in, in, the, in this one, but we have mm -hmm. seen arrests in Birmingham and a couple of more on Friday. Is there, I, that suggests mm -hmm. that this could be a broader network. It could be, and, and I think one thing to, to make note of the fact is that Khalid Massoud himself had a, a background as a petty criminal. He'd come into contact with law enforcers uh, for other types of non-terror offenses. And the prime minister pointed out that he had uh, been a peripheral, quote unquote, character in other terrorist in, uh, instances, but was, wasn't picked up, which, is, which recalls the Omar Mateen case right. in the U.S., where the, the authorities suspected something, but ultimately concluded he wasn't a threat. Unfortunately, it turned out to be the case. So, and this just goes to how difficult this, this new model of terrorism is, where it's these people with petty criminal backgrounds radicalized somehow. And then with, with just a car and a knife, they can unleash havoc um, and, on a major metropolitan and Birmingham, area. Yeah, Birming, Birmingham uh, in, in, is a particular mm -hmm. source of, of, of concern for mm -hmm. British security agencies. Explain why that is. Well, it's three areas that are, that are uh, where most of the j British jihadis come from. Right now, there's 3,000 jihadis that the uh, British authorities are looking at. Not all jihadis, but extreme cases, extremists, radicals, People and so who, forth. who are under uh, suspicion. Exactly. So you have uh, Birmingham and you have East London and you have a suburb of London called Luton. Um, these are areas where there are pockets of uh, Muslim communities, vast majority of them uh, perfectly law abiding, but there are, it's where these radical mosques, radical imams operate and where uh, most of the f foreign fighters, for example, who go off to, to Syria and Iraq may originate from these types of neighborhoods. And you see these patterns all across Europe, na specific neighborhoods around Brussels specific suburbs of Paris where you have illis typically ill-assimilated Muslim communities. It doesn't mean that all of them are taking time bombs, but that they, they're these ecosystems that breed jihadism. One of the things that's really interesting, this is the first big attack in Britain since I think the subway bombings in 2005. So mm -hmm. the, the British intelligence services, security agencies, have a pretty good record here. And yet they've been warning now for some weeks that there could be a lot more attacks. Is there any particular reason for they're, they've been saying that? Is this partly Syrian related, for example? Paul, I think that this has been something that we should have been um, 
alert to in the sense that as Islamic State is losing territory in, uh, in Iraq and Syria, that it may attempt to radicalize uh, more people. Now, again, it's not clear in this case whether uh, Khaled Massoud was directly radicalized or plugged in. He may not have been. But the, the fact that these organizations feel squeezed in their terrorist homeland, so to speak, may uh, result in, in more attacks abroad just for them to be able to say that they're still in the game. Um, I, I've heard from Middle Eastern security right. analysts and, and officials where they say, you know, watch out for the next wave might be ISIS 2.0 trying to prove itself, whatever that organization is, being extremely brutal. And then the remnants of ISIS 1.0 right. just trying to show that it's still in the game by, by staging brutal attacks. Okay, Sora Mari, thanks very much for uh, staying up late for us. And we have a Fox News alert. A hospital spokeswoman says one person has died in a shooting along the Las Vegas Strip. We've been monitoring this barricade situation. Police say one suspect is holed up inside a bus on the Strip near the Cosmopolitan Hotel and Casino. Uh, part of the Strip has been shut down and the casino floor of the hotel has been evacuated. Other guests are being told to stay in their rooms. Officials say one person is dead, another is wounded. We're going to bring you more details as they become available.